So in chapter 14, um, <clears throat> like chapter 13, we talk, we're talking about um, areas of study that you can take whole degrees in. Project management is one of those things that <clears throat> you can take a, a whole degree in how to be a project manager. Um, systems methodologies, uh, you know, programmers um, and other, um, you know, designers and analysts. Um, <clears throat> there's a whole whole areas of study involved in these. So we're really just kind of scratching the surface and giving you kind of a, an idea of um, these concepts. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about managing projects, a little bit about project management. We're going to get into um, in more detail how organizations decide to pursue different projects. What are some of the tools that they utilize to decide which projects to pursue, which projects to implement, which projects to invest in, okay? Um, runaway projects, which are projects that go over budget, over time, over cost, um, they make up somewhere around 30 to 40 percent of all IT projects, okay? Um, and these types of projects, there's different reasons why a, a project might be considered a runaway project or a project might be considered um, a failure. Um, and some of these reasons include that you fail to capture all of the user requirements that are needed for the system. Um, you don't actually provide the organizational benefits that were promised. Um, maybe you have, your system has a complicated, poorly um, implemented user interface. If the interface isn't user friendly, the users are going to try to find a way not to use the system. Or um, having a system that, that puts out inaccurate or inconsistent data. Okay, and that can definitely be a huge reason why a uh, system might be a failure. Okay? And a lot of these different reasons for systems to fail come back to the project management. Um, come back to um, making sure that the project team, the end users, the managers, all of the stakeholders that are working together in the project um, are doing what what they need to do to ensure that the project is a success. And some of the um, possible consequences of poor project management include cost overruns, so you go over budget, um, go over time, you have technical shortfalls. For some reason, the, the system does not perform as promised. Um, or it just doesn't give, it doesn't actually create the, the benefits that were anticipated. Okay. So project management, as a concept, it's all the activities that include things like planning work, assessing risk, estimating which res how many resources are going to be required, organizing that work, assigning tasks, controlling the project, the execution of the project, reporting progress, and analyzing results. Okay, and five major variables for any IS project include scope. That's what the scope is what work is going to be done in the project. The time, which is how long is the project going to take. Um, the cost, which is usually budgeted at the beginning. How much is the project going to, uh, what, how much in resources is it going to, um, to cost. Um, the quality of the project, um, how well it satisfies the objectives um, that it was set out to satisfy. <clears throat> and then of course analyzing risk. And risk is any threats to the success of a project. So when organizations are looking at selecting projects, there are some tools that they can utilize to do that. Um, and when it comes to selecting projects, the structure of the, the, structure of the organization comes into play. Um, the hierarchy in, in large, particularly in large firms, can play, play, tend to play a key role in deciding which um, projects to pursue. So we can take a look at this, um, this visual and look at the different uh, thing, the different tasks that are done at different levels of the organization. Senior management tends to do a lot of the strategic planning for the organization. So your corporate strategic planning group and IS steering committee usually come from your senior to middle management. 
Um, your project management comes from middle management to your operational, and the project team, if it's from within the organization, tends to come from your operational, um, your operational management. Okay. Information systems projects have to have some kind of plan. Okay, and a plan for a system for a project, it I. Um, identifies um, the projects that are going to deliver the most business value um, and um, links the development to the plan. Okay? This, a big part of choosing which, which investments, which projects to invest in, comes back to making sure that you are keeping track of the business um, strategies that you're pursuing. Okay? So, um, and go back to when we talked about um, some of the generic strategies, the Porter's generic strategies, right? Walmart, what, their strategy is low cost, right? That's the strategy that they pursue and everything that they implement, everything that they invest in comes back to supporting that particular strategy. They do a very good job from their top management all the way down to making sure that every investment that they, um, that they they move forward with supports that low cost strategy. Okay? Organizations have to, it, it's easy for managers to get caught up in new technologies. What is, you know, what is your, um, what is your, uh, techno what is your competition doing? But if it doesn't fit the strategy that your organization is pursuing, you shouldn't move forward with it and you shouldn't invest in it. Okay? So the systems, this information systems plan helps to keep sight of the strategy that you're pursuing and making sure that the, the investments that you move forward with support that strategy. Okay, so this plan includes, it's a roadmap to look at the direction of the system's development including the purpose, strategic business plan rationale, what are the current systems that we have, um, what are the new developments that we should think about, um, what is our management strategy for change, implementation of the plan, and the, and the budget. Okay. Um, organizations need to keep track of their existing processes, their existing um, hardware, software systems, um, in order to make sure that um, that they that if you move forward with some new system, you understand what you what you have existing and what you might have to change if you move forward. In order to have a good information systems plan, you also have to keep track of your short-term and long-term information requirements. Okay, what are, what are the things that we're going to want to do with our systems the next, in the next budget year? What are the things that we're going to want to do five years and ten years down the road? And how can our investment support those strategies? Okay, so one way of doing this is looking at the um, critical success factors approach, or CSF. It looks at the requirements, the information requirements or your user requirements as a set of small critical um, success factors. Okay? Um, now the process for doing that, um, for actually coming up with these critical success factors, you interview three to four top managers identifying the goals and the, those critical success factors. You take those success factors um, aggregate those from the, the, the interviews, and then you build systems that will deliver on those critical success factors. Um, this approach is good for determining the need for decision support systems and um, uh, executive support systems, really systems that support the work of your strategic management. Um, but it, it, they have it's not necessarily the best way of developing systems for the entire organization because you're really getting the input from the strategic management. Okay, so it's, it can be hard to get um, the, taking the critical success factors you get from your top managers and connecting them to the entire organization. Um, and there can be, when you're interviewing your managers, there can be confusion between individual critical success factors and critical success factors for the whole organization. They may not understand, so when they're talking about critical success factors, they may be talking about personal or individual ones. 
And of course, because you're, you're interviewing top management, it's going to have a bias toward top management. It's going to lead to critical success factors that are important to top management. So it's, going, it's, it's really better for systems that support their decision making. Um, so this is a visual for looking at using critical success fa um, factors to develop systems. You're taking different managers' critical success factors. You're aggregating and analyzing those critical success factors. So out of all the different managers that you're interviewing, you come up with one, one list of critical success factors. Um, you take the, the critical success factors from what the managers had to say and you, just, you need to connect them to the organization. Um, so you're developing uh, uh, organizational critical success factors for the whole company. And then you take those critical success factors and help to develop decision support systems, databases, and other systems. Okay? So this is one way of, um, of selecting projects. Another way is using a portfolio or doing a portfolio analysis. Um, portfolio analyses are used to evaluate different alternative system projects. And in a portfolio, you inventory all of the organization's projects and assets, everything that they have. And you look at each system. Each system has a profile of risk and benefit. Okay? So, when, so you're looking at different levels of risk and benefit. You want to look at the portfolio as a whole and try to balance the risk and return from different systems. Okay, So this is one way of looking at project risk, right? The potential benefits and, and risk. If you have a project that has high risk but high benefits, you might cautiously examine whether to move forward with those because they're very high risk. If it has high risk and low benefit, you're probably going to want to avoid that because it's not going to, to pay off. If you have um, high benefit and low risk, these are the ones you want to move on. And if you have low, be low benefits and low risk, these are going to be some of the routine, usually routine automation types of projects. Okay? Another way of looking at organizational projects is um, having a scoring model. Okay? Uh, a scoring model is used quite often when there are a lot of different criteria to measure. Um, and this is where you're assigning weight to different features of the system. So here you'll notice that we have different criteria or features of, of a system that we want. We have different weights. So you'll notice that online order entry and inventory check are weighted he more heavily than warehouse receiving. Um, when you look at the percentages for the system A and system B, right, you use this weight to generate a score. Okay. Even though you'll notice that um, online order entry for system A um, is it, you know, is is lower than warehouse receiving, it generates a higher score because the weight of that particular uh, function is higher. We value that function higher than warehouse receiving, right? And it comes up with um, different scoring total scores for each system so that we can evaluate which system to move forward with and which not to move forward with. Okay. Another, um, you can also look at information systems um, from their costs and benefits standpoints. Um, and there's two different types of benefits. We've talked about these benefits before. Um, Tangible benefits are the benefits that are quantifiable. These are the benefits that you can easily measure. Um, usually they're assigned, they're very easy to assign a monetary value, so it's easy to measure that type of value. Um, these types of, these, the systems that have a lot of tangible benefits tend to be the type that displace labor and save space, automation types of systems, transaction clerical systems, stuff like that. Intangible benefits, they can't be immediately quantified. Um, things like um, customer satisfaction, something that um, that may lead to gains in the long run, but it's harder for you to measure that benefit. Okay, um, and these tend to be things like you know more efficient customer service, enhanced decision making, things like that. How do you measure that? Um, systems for that influence decision making, um, decision support systems, uh, it, uh, executive support systems. These are the types of systems that that actually provide a lot of these intangible benefits. Okay. 
Another way of, uh, of um, looking at information systems and the business value they provide is um, capital budgeting. Some of the capital budgeting models, they look at um, the value of an investment in the long run, okay? Looking at investing in a system as a long-term capital investment project. So you're looking at measuring the firm's your cash outflows, which are basically what are the expenditures for the system in hardware, software, and labor, and what are the cash inflows that are kind of come in from that that system. Increased sales, reduced costs, other other benefits or cash inflows. Okay, and there's a lot of different capital budget budgeting models that are used for IT payback, um, re, rate return on an investment, net present value, internal rate of return. Um, so these are there's a lot of different models that come under uh, this capital budgeting, um, particular uh, capital budgeting. Real options pricing models. Um, these are used for future when you're measuring future revenue streams of IT projects. Um, usually, when those future revenue streams are uncertain and you have a lot of high um, upfront costs, um, these models borrow concepts from the financial industry. Um, these give managers the flexibility to test the waters with small um, pilot projects or prototypes to kind of get a little bit of idea of what investing in the whole project would be like. Um, some of the limitations of these financial models, they don't take into account social and organizational dimensions. They're really more about um, you know, the financial and accounting um, aspects of determining of the business value of that system. Um, another area of project management that has to be managed very carefully is project risk. Okay? Um, risk in an, uh, a project is determined by um, certain areas, the project size, the larger the project, the more parts of the organization it affects, the higher the risk. Um, if the organization is extremely complex, you have a multinational organization that has multiple um, divisions under it, very complex organization, it's going to add to the risk of that of a project. The structure of the project, if the project is more structured, it's going to lower the risk because again, you're doing putting a lot of work up front and there's a lot of documentation that supports the project as you move forward. Um, the experience of your project team with technology, um, of their project teams um, have, if you decide to move forward with a new technology that you've never used before in, um, in a, a project, it's possible that you could in, you're going to increase the risk of that project overall. Another part of uh, project risk is change management. Um, an organization can can undergo a lot of change depending on the system and what it, what parts of the organization it's going to affect. Okay, so you have to have a way of managing the the change that 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 system is going to create within the organization. Okay, um, and some of the things that a system might change includes how the information is used. You might have dis new distributions of authority and power. Maybe you're empowering some of your operational employees with more information. They don't have to go to their managers to get that information anymore. It's changing the balance of power, and that can be a change that has to be managed if it if it um, you know affects people's jobs. Um, Internal change can possibly breed resistance and opposition, and there's many different reasons why this type of uh, resistance or opposition might build up. Um, but making sure that that opposition or that resistance is identified and dealt with, because if it um, it can torpedo a, a, a project from the inside, so you, it's it's important to deal with that. Okay. Um, with implementation, um, it, you have project risk. We talked about the four different types of implementation and how that direct cutover um, implementation was the riskiest of all of the implementation strategies, so depending on the strategy that you decided to move forward with. 
every project should have some kind of change agent. We talked about um, systems analysts as a change agent. Um, a change agent is going to look at the configurations and interactions, the job activities, and the power relationships of organizational groups and see if these things are changed by the implementation of this new system. Um, they should be a catalyst for the entire change process. Um, and they're responsible for ensuring that all parties involved accept the changes. Um, it's possible to have um, managers at different levels that don't support the system. If you don't get them on board, they can um, start to breed that resistance or opposition that can, um, that can lead to system uh, project failure. Another part of project risk has to do with um, end users. If end users, um, if there's high levels of end user involvement, the system is most likely going to, um, it's going to do what the users expect it to do, and, and users in, in turn are more likely to accept the system because they have been involved throughout the process. Um, if there is a division between the users and the IT, um, the project team, um, that gap can lead to misunderstandings in what the system should do, okay? Because when you're looking at the project team and the users of the system, they have different backgrounds and interests, different priorities. They're, they're, they have possibly different goals. Um, and because of these differences in their understanding, right, the project team, the designer, um, maybe if you hire a company coming in from the outside, the designer doesn't really understand what end users do in a day-to-day -day basis, okay? They just know that the system needs to do A, B, and C. And if you don't bring in those users to tell them, well, although our process says, the documentation says that this is what we do, actually we do the A, B, and C. We do this instead, right? If they don't, if they don't understand, they're not made to understand what the process is really like, um, they can build the systems that don't meet in user requirements, that don't meet the user expectation. Okay? You also have to have management support and com commitment, and this is really important too. Uh, managers um, are the ones that handle all of the resources and funding. Uh, managers are the ones that can lead and create organizational change, or they can lead and breed resistance to a system. Right? Managers can work for a project or against a project. Um, and you want to make sure that um, managers create a, uh, are a part of the change process, positively a part of the change process. Um, one type of, um, of system that ha tends to have a very high failure rate are those application systems that we talked about, right? CRM systems, supply chain management, um, ERP systems, and business process redesign projects also have a very high fail failure rate. Okay, and some of the reasons for this are poor implementation and change management processes. Um, employees might have concern about change, about change that concerns that are not addressed. Um, you might have resist resistance by key managers, and again, um, your employees are going to take their, uh, their attitudes about a system from their managers. Um, you might have change that includes new job functions, career paths, or recru recruitment practices, right? Have, um, changing the jobs that people are doing, taking away or adding to their workload, creating new positions and bringing people from the outside, which might be resistance. Um, mergers and acquisitions tend to be another area that have a similarly high failure rate. And with mergers and acquisitions, when you are bringing two companies together, you're bringing two systems together also. At least two systems, if not more. Okay, so you're merging the, the information infrastructure of two organizations together, okay? Um, this leads to considerable amounts of organizational change. Um, and, the, and these types of projects, mergers and acquisitions, tend to have very complex, tend to be very complex projects. And if you recall, a complex project, the more, the more complexity to the project, the higher the risk of that project. 
So some of the things that can be done to control or manage project risk. Um, you identify the nature and level of the risk of the project, right? And if you recall from the uh, portfolio analysis, right, you can, you can have um, high, maybe medium and low levels of risk. Um, you can um, manage the project with tools and other risk management approaches to, um, that are geared towards different levels of risk, high, medium, and low. Um, you can also manage the technical complexity of the project um, using internal integration tools. Okay? Things like having frequent team meetings, ha including highly experienced team members, people that have been through multiple systems development projects and know how the process moves. Um, possibly even securing outside technical expertise, hiring people with expertise that your project team is missing. Okay. So um, one, of, one of the tools that is utilized in project management is called the Gantt chart. Um, and a Gantt chart looks at the entire project timing-wise and shows you what are some of the different tasks that are going to be done. So you can go through in a t you know, in, and see exactly what is supposed to be done at what, um, at what part, in what um, part of the project. It also includes um, information about who is supposed to be doing what. And this shows different man hours. Um, with a total number of, of man hours for each phase of the project. Now a per chart um, looks at the ordering of project tasks and it shows dependencies in those tasks. Okay, so you'll see this one here is for designing a website um, or creating a website. With this project de website design, you'll show you have to have the design of the website, you write the HTML and finalize the code. Before you can finalize the code, you have to create the artwork for the project. You have to have any um, graphics that are going to be used. Um, and before you can test your website, you have to select a hosting service. So these arrows here show dependencies, uh, prerequisites for tasks, things that have to be done before other tasks can be completed. Okay? And that's important to know because if you try to do, you know, you try to move forward in this with these, these um, in this path, you have to make sure that you're doing other things simultaneously, possibly, right? Writing HTML while you're selecting the hosting service or creating artwork to make sure that you can move forward with other tasks. Another part of um, managing project risk, increasing user involvement, um, overcoming the, the resistance that, might, that users might have. Um, you can use internal integration tools um, to link the work of the team to all organizational levels. So this helps with active involvement of your users. Um, and it helps to um, create responsiveness among the project team to users. So when users have questions, they have concerns, um, these types of tools can help with that. Um, you have to make sure that you are um, aware of any user um, resistance to change. Um, users might be resistant to change because they believe that the change is detrimental to their interests. Right? Maybe they are afraid that a new system that is more complex, that can do more, might eventually replace them. Um, and user resistance can lead to what's called counter um, implementation, where you actually deliberately try to thwart the implementation of a system. Okay. So some strategies to help overcome user resistance include user participation, education and training, making sure that users understand what changes are going to be involved and what, it, what it's going to lead to for them. Um, management um, policies, incentives for cooperation, improvement of a user interface, making sure that the user interface is easy to use for users, resolution of any organizational problems. Um, one of the, the most used uh, tools for, um, for dealing with users tends to be being told that we're implementing this new system. 
you're going to have to use it. Um, it's not the it's not the the best way of um, getting over of um, overcoming user resistance. Just because you're told that you have to use something doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to like it or that you're going to be productive or that you're going to use it to its full capabilities. So um, that's not necessarily the best way of, of overcoming that, that resistance. You also have to look at designing for the organization. You have to keep, um, keep in mind what, um, the way that these system projects address um, organizational changes. Right? What are some of the changes that um, we're going to have in our procedures, our job functions, the structure of the or organization might change, um, the power relationships and other things. So keeping track of all of the ways that the organization will be changed by that system. Okay. Agronomics um, is the study of the interaction of people and machines in a work environment. So um, this we usually think of agronomics as the health issues involved with um, the phys your physical environment and trying to make it as um, trying to make it as physically um, comfortable as possible. Um, but agronomics also includes you know the design of jobs overall. Okay, so that might be a part of that. You also have to look at the impact that a system will have on an organization. The structure, attitudes, the decision making, and the operations of the organization. Um, socio, socio technological design is taking into account not just the technological aspects of a system, but also the human aspects. Um, you should have solutions that address both aspects because an organization um, is more than just the tools and the technologies that you utilize. It's it's the people and the culture. Okay, um, so you want to have a design that meets both objectives: your technical and your social. Now, there's project management software that th that can automate a lot of these different pieces of project management. Um, can track your pro progress, assign resources. And when they say assigning resources to tasks, they mean assigning people. When they say resources, they mean people. <laughs> um, capabilities for defining, ordering, and editing the tasks. When we looked at the, the Gantt chart and that PERT chart, um, both of those are um, tools that can be used that can be utilized from within this these project management software. Microsoft Project 2010 is one of the well, Microsoft Project in general is one of the most used project management software that's out there. Um, I had a colleague when I was um, in uh, my, my, uh, my master's program, um, I had a colleague that used Project, I think it was 2008, for planning her wedding. <laughs> um, she actually had all of the tasks for her wedding. She had assigned different bridal party. Um, bridal parties and different tasks. She was very, she was very organized. <laughs> to say. Um, but again, with project management, these are some of the different uh, different types of tools that are available in project. But there's other project management software that's out there. But again, this is the one that's most widely used. And there's been an increase in the use of open source project management software as well as um, software as a service. So if you, you know, cloud computing and um, the use of applications um, online. 